Welcome. Um, I'm going to make this really quick on my part because these folks are really have a lot of fantastic things to, to tell us about and we want to hopefully have some time for Q&A at the end. The only other thing I'm going to quickly say is um, I want to give a shout out to the student workers who are working here at this conference and really helping to make things run. <laughs> And we expect you to be on panels a lot faster than I came back to be on a panel. Um, okay, so without further ado, um, we're going to uh, have uh, Jane Gilbert here, who's the Chief Resiliency Officer for the City of Miami, and she's going to get us started. Oh, good afternoon. It is such an honor and pleasure to be here this afternoon. Back on this campus, it's changed a lot, but in many ways uh, it hasn't. I still have the same great feelings about being here. So, um, and it's also uh, really an honor to be with this panel. I'm so impressed with this group of scholars and women really committed to community strengthening and transformation. And I have several family members and friends in the audience, so that makes it a little daunting to be here. Um, but anyway, uh, climate change in Miami. I want to give just a broad overview of some of the climate change risks we're experiencing, and particularly the vulnerable populations. And then so a little bit about our journey of engaging with residents and coming up with solutions. Uh, it's been a learning journey. Um, so, Miami is the urban center within a larger county metropolitan area of 2.7 million people, Miami-Dade County. Over half the population is foreign born, two thirds Hispanic, about 17% would identify themselves as either African American or Afro Caribbean. Um, in Miami, the core, the dark red you see there is represents census tracts where over 50% of the children are growing up in households living in poverty. Um, we have in Miami, the, the, um, it's about 29% overall poverty rate, but another 40% uh, are, are struggling to make ends meet. Our wage levels are very low. Our cost of housing and transportation is very high. So um, we really live in a tale of two cities in Miami. So our main impacts are more extreme heat, sea level rise, and more chronic flooding, and then more extreme storm events. In extreme heat, we've always been a tropical place. We're very used to hot weather, and therefore have more air conditioning, more ways to accommodate for that. However, just since the 1970s, we've had over 70 degree, over 70 more days a year, over 90 degrees. And so, um, and the map in the center shows where those, we have more extreme heat, heat islands, where there's more concrete, less tree canopy, which pretty much align with some of our lower income neighborhoods. Um, and that can have different impacts on our populations. Kids playing outdoors, elderly um, are more vulnerable, outdoor workers, construction workers, landscape workers, um, people living with respiratory illnesses. This is a woman, uh, Charlene Jones, who lives in Miami, and uh, is very, feeling very isolated because she can't go outside to walk in her neighborhood for many days of the year because it's not safe for her to do so. Miami's probably most known for increasing flood risks uh, because it is a low-lying peninsula and uh, on a limestone bed, so it, our substrate is porous. We can't just build walls and keep out the water. The water comes from the east, the west, above and below. Um, this map shows what our seasonal high tide flood extent would be with two feet of sea level rise. Some people think the whole city is gonna be inundated. It's actually not that, and this is, would be occasional flooding, but it is primarily higher valued real estate. We're gonna hear uh, about experiences in New Orleans. It's a little different. It's almost an inverse relationship where, where uh, some of the lower income neighborhoods are low-lying, uh, here we have an inverse relationship. 
These, there are some mixed income neighborhoods which experience sunny day flooding. Luckily, we have been able to install backflow prevention valves, which have temporarily eliminated that flooding, um, but that is temporary. Uh, Miami's always experienced hurricanes. We've had 31 since the mid 1800s. It's not climate change induced. What is climate change induced is with sea level rise, we have an increased risk of storm surge. We have more extreme rainfall events and higher, higher winds. So the impacts are stronger. The photos on the right are some of the storm surge we experienced from Hurricane Irma in 2017. Luckily, within a few hours, that storm surge was gone because it was a compounded by a high, seasonal high tide. Climate change also has impacts on development patterns. Miami is a growing city. We've grown 20% in the last decade. So we have a lot of development pressures and gentrification even without climate change. But because some of our traditionally lower income minority neighborhoods are along the higher elevation areas, that is getting compounded. The pressures of displacement are being compounded. This is in Little Haiti. Um, so all of those climate risks drove Miami-Dade County, City of Miami, and Miami Beach to apply to a global program, 100 Resilient Cities, funded by Rockefeller Program, to help develop a strategy in response. And Rockefeller looks at this from a much broader than just climate change, the, that, that cities are becoming greater accumulators of risk, both because of climate change, but also more dense density in cities, globalization, rapid changes in our economy. And so they define urban resilience as the capacity of individuals, communities, and businesses and systems to uh, respond, adapt, grow in the face of increasing shocks and, and chronic stresses facing the city. It's almost like building a, a healthy immune system for a city. So uh, shocks can be things you know we're gonna have like a hurricane or things we didn't expect like Zika. Uh, stresses are, are things that weaken the fabric of a society, making it more difficult to bounce back in the, if, if like chronic transportation problems, affordable housing and the slow moving increasing stress of sea level rise. So we went out and we engaged a lot of different people, 3,000 people, over 3,000 residents, businesses, mayors, experts in different fields. And I wanna tell you about just my experience in reaching out to a traditionally African-American neighborhood in, little, little, in uh, Liberty City and a Hispanic neighbor in East Little Havana. And what we learned is that the uh, Rockefeller developed concepts of resilience and their fancy graphs and wheels, et cetera, were uh, very difficult for people to understand. And even the word resilience, particularly in Spanish, was difficult. Um, and that they just wanted to talk in real terms about jobs, living wage jobs, public health, access to decent education for their kids. They didn't think climate change was a priority. And, and so it was, um, we learned to change our narrative and to do a lot more listening as a result. Um, it, it really uh, turned the tide. And Miami led a full third of this strategy focused on people where we were really focusing on how does this relate to affordable housing, um, access to living wage jobs and financial security, public health threats, and preparing people for hurricanes. After that outreach, it, that outreach mostly happened before Irma. After Irma, our vulnerable communities really started to understand how directly climate change is impacting them and organizations within them, they started to organize. So we felt it was important to start to change the narrative. And so within the city, we 
started to develop just focused on climate change strategy, but we wanted to do outreach to neighborhoods in the lowest income neighborhoods, invite people from the neighboring neighborhoods that might have been higher income, but but have it rooted in their neighborhoods. Make sure that we use, hire people within the neighborhoods to help with outreach, provide food, childcare, translation, and really spend very little time talking to them and most of the time hearing what they were most worried about as it related to extreme heat, increasing flood risk, increasing storm risks. And um, we shared different maps of those neighborhoods and then got them and really took a different approach with where we're not government, we're here to help you. We're not government, we're here with some superpower cape. We actually don't have the answers. And these are big challenges that are way beyond government's hand ability to manage, particularly local government. So we needed ideas from them on how to prioritize solutions and what kind of solutions we could work on together. And it really started to change the narrative. And some of the priorities they came up with is that they really wanted more education and outreach. They wanted more green infrastructure, that being trees or living shorelines or uh, bioswales. Big focus on hardening our electrical grid because that's one of the biggest health risks we face if we go down. Uh, in a hurricane, and a lot more, particularly in the low-income neighborhoods, focus on just our basic operations and maintenance of our streetways, our drains, and the trees in the right-of-way. So we released that strategy just a couple weeks ago, and some of the biggest priorities that are addressing these populations are to have street level message, um, electronic message boards. I've seen some here in New York since I've been here that I think are really great. Uh, increasing training, we've trained over 100 citizen emergency response team volunteers. What these are, your neighbor is your first responder. Making sure that in the event of, an, of a disaster, um, we can't rely on the emergency management personnel to get out there. So having them trained and having more communication with them. Engaging citizens in collecting key data that'll inform our decisions in the future, and then building resilience hubs, places people can walk to post-disaster to cool off, charge their phone, uh, get their medical supplies chilled, food, ice, et cetera, that are trusted places that people go to for programming throughout the year. Um, and more community partnerships around education. Uh, so, in the infrastructure area, we passed a bond, we call it the Miami Forever Bond. It wasn't my idea for a name. <laughs> I wouldn't have called it that. But anyway, 100 million of that is dedicated to affordable housing, both to help low-income homeowners harden their homes, but also to uh, preserve and create more affordable housing. And we've put into, in the 200 million for flood prevention, a priority on equity and public safety and uh, tree planting and reconsidering our free trolley routes to access business centers, so for commuting. And then finally, for promoting adaptive neighborhoods, we actually have a lot of people who didn't have AC, elderly people in public housing, disabled people. So we made sure they got AC units and um, assisted them. We, 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 we passed post IRMA a requirement because there, to, that all assisted living facilities and federally funded affordable housing facilities that with elderly and disabled must have a generator with three days of fuel. Um, and we're partnering with uh, the enterprise community partners on a series of tools and resources to retrofit our existing affordable housing. I could say a lot more, but I want to hear from our other panels, so thank you. I look forward to questions. Our next panelist is Adriana Garriga Lopez, and she is an associate professor of anthropology at Kalamazoo College in Michigan and is going to <laughs> step up to the mic right now. Buenas tardes. Good afternoon, everyone. It's 
great to be here. Thank you to the organizers. Thank you to Eve, especially, for all the work you put into this. Uh, it's good to be here in Lenape territory. Um, I'm an anthropologist born and raised in San Juan, Puerto Rico. And <laughs> I love that. <laughs> and um, I live in Michigan most of the year, where I'm a professor at Kalamazoo College in Kalamazoo, Michigan. And the rest of the time, whenever I can get away, I'm in Puerto Rico, where I conduct my research. And since December of 2017, I've been studying small farming and agroecology movements in Puerto Rico, uh, specifically working with uh, women farmers, with queer, trans, um, gender nonconforming people who are engaging with agroecology as a mode of decolonization. After Hurricane Maria, I began to look at, learn from, and study with these small farmers. Um, and as you know, in Puerto Rico, we've had a couple of crisis-laden years from hurricanes to earthquakes. Uh, most recently, starting in December of 28th, uh, Puerto Rico's been undergoing an earthquake swarm where uh, more than 3,000 uh, earthquakes have happened in the last month destroying several um, small towns in the southwest of the island, the Big Island. Um, and although hurricanes and earthquakes are, of course, natural occurrences, there's nothing natural about the disasters that have followed the hurricane, um, Hurricane Maria, as well as Hurricane Irma, and these earthquakes. Um, so, you know, looking at the title of this session, I was thinking about that term, natural disasters, and and how much um, it does not actually describe what have been primarily political crises and political disasters that um, have taken place in Puerto Rico. And the suffering of the people in Puerto Rico um, is primarily an expression of US colonialism rather than of uh, the particular crises created by uh, hurricanes and earthquakes. Uh, which of course are, are part of the picture, but the, the, overall, um, uh, the, the overall result of those events have been political. And of course it's not just Trump uh, with his very New York white supremacist hatred of Puerto Ricans. The history um, of the past 120 years of US colonialism has been a history of violence, exploitation, and neglect. So it's not just Trump, right? And yet, after Maria, we did see, for the first time in a long time, large numbers of people in Puerto Rico going hungry, right? And having limited access to water. And we also saw, in very um, impressive ways, the, the, the level of um, community organization that took place, and what I've called autonomous organizing, in an essay that I published uh, in Shima Island Studies Journal, translating the term that we use in Puerto Rico, which is autogestión, as autonomous organizing, allows us to think in a space that's a little bit outside of that uh, green capitalism mode that is so, um, so intertwined with disaster capitalism in Puerto Rico, right? So how do we differentiate between these different modes of disaster response and recovery. And so I'm interested in what we call autogestión, but in particular in the kind of autonomous practices that um, people generated in order to help each other in a context of state abandonment, which is what happened after Maria and is happening again now uh, to those affected by the earthquakes in Puerto Rico. So I, I'm, I'm writing about these queer feminist femme trans farmers and their farming projects as practices of anticipatory freedom, as future-oriented practices, right, that contemplate the likelihood of permanent crisis in Puerto Rico as we see an increasing number and intensity of hurricanes, the salinization of aquifers, sea level rise, and desertification as you know, already happening, as processes of climate change that are already taking place, not just in Puerto Rico, but all over the Caribbean. So my postulate is that small farming as a queer feminist practice of decolonization is happening at a human scale 
in a, in, a, in, a, in a sense, it's a conundrum, it's an oxymoron, because Puerto Rico is undergoing a moment of intensification of colonialism, right? Uh, and therefore of unfreedom. So it's, it's, it's an oxymoron, it's a strange thing to talk about, for example, food sovereignty in a context where there is no national state sovereignty, there is no economic sovereignty. And I wanna underscore this point, which is that Puerto Rico exists in a blockade. Right, that what US military power in Puerto Rico means is that help cannot come from any place other than the United States. So if the United States does not respond in a context of disaster, then no one else can provide uh, assistance to Puerto Rico. And we don't often talk about that as a blockade, but I'd like to present to you that that's exactly what it is. So when I look at um, community organizing, autonomous organizing, um, and these practices of anticipatory freedom, I'm also talking about something that I've called in an essay on dance and performance art in Puerto Rico, body communism. And body communism is just another way of talking about these practices of anticipatory freedom that include seeing food and the ability to feed ourselves as the foundation of a politics of self-determination, as the foundation for community autonomy, in uh, a time when the colonial state is more keen than ever to enact necropolitical governance strategies that range from murder by ne medical neglect to depopulation and cultural genocide to gentrification and starvation. So delivering and guaranteeing access to water, sustainable energy and food sources are now cutting edge feminist preoccupations in a post Maria context when warehouses full of expired water bottles and uh, emergency supplies are discovered as having never been delivered. And this is like uh, yesterday they discovered another warehouse full of undelivered supplies in Puerto Rico. So again, I know looking at the title of this session, uh, Hunger Praise to Rage for Resilience for the Courage and Ability to Withstand and Resist, to withstand another round of insults another attack, another racist attack. It is in fact our rage that supported our protest during the summer of 19 when uh, we ousted the then governor, Ricky Rosselló, and when we were so in love with ourselves out in the streets that we forgot to eat until anarchist youths brought us snacks, vegan sandwiches, and bottles of water. So I want to say that queer feminist femme farmers are epistemic leaders in the horizoning work needed to perceive new thresholds and new approaches necessitated by climate change and the urgency of decolonization. And even though talking about food sovereignty and food justice in Puerto Rico in the context of colonialism that severely limits access to fresh foods, land and water is an oxymoron, it's also the best way Puerto Ricans have found to survive colonialism in the present. So it's not just a future-oriented strategy, right? So by avoiding or circumventing the commodity chain, the commodity chain, uh, farmers are able to avoid um, the commodification of their products, right? So I'm interested in this, these um, exchange economies that are also part of the farming movement. And again, hunger prays to rage for resilience, but we know resilience in itself is not enough. It's not enough to survive a future of increasing storm frequency, water salinization, sea level rise, and desertification. What do we pray for when our hunger has been sated? The queer feminist farmers I work with posit that the answer to that question depends on how we satiate our people's hunger. If we do so through embodied practices of autonomy, collaboration, and ecological regeneration, what we hunger for after food needs have been met is the freedom that farming allows us to discern. Puerto Ricans are hungry for freedom and decolonization. Our leadership consists of queer, feminist, femme, and trans people, whose practices of survival are already a map for the future. Intentionally reframing food justice as a queer trans feminist labor is now our hope for survival into the future. Thank you. I don't even want to follow anything with that at the moment, <laughs> but, but we do have.
more wonderful folks on the panel. So I'm going to welcome uh, Linnell Thomas, who's Associate Professor of American Studies at UMass Boston, to continue our conversation. And I do think we're going to have time at the end for your questions, so I hope that you're taking some notes. You don't want to follow, but you want me to follow. OK. I, I see how this works. If you will oblige me, I'd like to begin with Lamel Moise's performance of her poem, Where Our Protests Sound, from which the title of our panel comes. This was her performance at Verse Fest in 2014. Jazz is underwater, voodoo Atlantis mute, aborted ultrasound, fetal fish in flood. Hades first cousin forcibly kissed by a hurricane called Katrina. Hot winds come one fat Tuesday. Old levy leak explodes. Fixing funds gone to homeland security. Soldiers stationed in Iraq said jazz is underwater. Days like laissez-faire. Mama does not fall. Saviors do not save. Hunger prays to rage for resilience. Improvisational genius implodes. Anarchy duets with despair. Basis fingers loot, nimble like a deft pianist, said Vodou Atlantis mute. The fragile eardrums of instant orphans get inundated with someone else's mama's soprano saxophone screams. Meanwhile, televised tenor voices report monotonous drone to drown out the deafening beat of funeral marchers can't swim. Bloated trumpet carcasses, a singer swallows human sewage, her last note, a curse on America, aborted ultrasound, the gauntlet's warning scatter brains, pedestrians hear calls to evacuate, escape, and think how fast, how fast can on foot run. The poor, the weary just round. People in wheelchairs just drown. The sick in bed cannot leave. Their doctors stay behind, too. New emergencies engulf the ER. Swamped hospitals, eight hostels, eight shelters. Resources slim like hope. Nurses stay behind, too. Their loyal partners will not leave. Ill-fated rejects just drown, said fetal fish in flood. Outside, a breaking willow weeps like a father on his rooftop, murmuring his wife's last words. Hutch tight to our babies and let me die, she had pleaded. You can't hold on to us all. Let me die. She too, like jazz, is underwater. Her love, her certainty will haunt him. Their children's survival, a scar. Sanity also loses its grip. Guilt weight like cold, wet clothes. 80% of New Orleans submerged. Debris lingers, diseases loom set. Days like laissez-faire. Mana does not fall. Shock battles suicide thoughts. Some thirsty throats cope. Manage dirges in Cajun in Zydeco. Out of state kin can't get through refugees. Refugees remember ruined homes. A preacher remembers the book of Revelation. Still, saviors wait to save, and the living wade with the countless dead while a wealthy president flies overhead. Up where brown people look, up where brown people look like spoiled jambalaya stewing from a distance in their down there. Distress said he's free. High up, far up. Vacation, fresh eagle, up, up, and away from the place where our protest sound started, still sings American music, gurgling cyclone litanies. Man cannot <coughs> prevent the man cannot hear. Hello. <laughs> So I wanted to begin with Moise's performance of her poem, one, because she read it a lot better than I would have. But the poem, I think, also makes a compelling argument, probably even stronger than I do in my own work, of how Hurricane Katrina illuminated the correlation between race, risk, rescue, and recovery. 
This was not new in New Orleans. The New Orleans environmental precarity made it inhospitable for European colonizers. They had assistance in making New Orleans viable from Native Americans who had already established trade routes throughout the city um, who identified for them higher ground that was least susceptible to flooding from enslaved Africans who had come and were skilled laborers and artisans in many cases, who helped to build and design the city, who in the early colonial period outnumbered whites and brought with them a strong culture and were able to maintain their language to make New Orleans what the historian Gwendolyn Midlow Hall calls the most African city in the United States. As the city expanded, it relied on industry and technology to harness nature in the name of progress. And that's taken many forms, the extensive drainage system, the levee system that has deepened and rerouted the Mississippi River, selling rights to oil, gas, and pipeline companies, dredging canals for often ill-fated economic gambles that created physical and social divides in the city. In all of these things that have really devastated the coastal wetlands and made New Orleans more susceptible to storm surges and hurricanes. One example is the dredging of the Industrial Canal in the early 20th century. And it was dredged in the Ninth Ward in New Orleans, an area of the city that was attractive to African Americans and recent immigrants who could afford land in that area. The canal bisected that neighborhood and destroyed the natural defense system that existed there and um, that protected the neighborhood against flooding in the process. The commission at the time in the early 20th century called um, the Industrial Canal a monument to the power of man over the forces of nature and to the progress of a community that will not say die. And ironically, the canal and all of those other innovations that I mentioned before were actually responsible for numerous deaths during Hurricane Katrina. This um, is an image of the Industrial Canal and the flooding of the Ninth Ward in 2005. It was no coincidence that as the city was taming nature in pursuit of progress, African Americans and the city's poor were increasingly pushed out and priced out of the city, relegated to the most vulnerable, um, environmentally susceptible or flood susceptible portions of the city. So as we can see, and to underscore Adriana's point, there was nothing natural about the devastation caused by Hurricane Katrina. This was truly a man-made disaster. And nothing has been natural about the recovery process. The city invested billions of dollars to bring in visitors so that they could return to the city, resuscitating the tourism industry at the same time that Residents, including over 100,000 African Americans, had no support to return to the city. In many cases, had no homes to return to. That, and especially given the case that um, public housing was raised wholesale in the city, uh, gentrification, the discriminatory practices of the Road Home Grant Program, so that even people who could return home were again pushed to areas of the city that were most environmentally um, vulnerable. We can see that in the disparity of the tourist sections of the city. This is a picture of Jackson Square, the heart of the New Orleans French Quarter, that I took in 2007 or 2008. And if we juxtapose that, with images of the Lower Ninth Ward and photographs that I took between 2007 and 2014. 
the juxtaposition of tourist New Orleans and areas where African Americans and particularly poor and working class African American lives is, is jarring. And many of these neighborhoods in the lower Ninth Ward are still in that condition. So I have devoted most of my time to speaking about the hunger, praise to rage portion of the title. I did want to at least end with one example of resilience and not I'll just do a brief picture of maybe a more corporate model of resilience. This is an image from Brad Pitt's Make It Right, which was all wrong, but Make It Right <laughs> Foundation in New Orleans. But this image is from the Bayou Bienvenue Wetland Triangle. This was built in 2008, a partnership between residents of the Ninth Ward, social justice and environmental organizations and universities in the city. They, um, it's used to tell the history of this ecosystem and the importance of wetland preservation. The area had been um, a natural freshwater habitat for wildlife and vegetation and a source for, of sustenance and recreation for Ninth Ward residents. It was um, also a natural buffer because of the cypress swamp against storm surges and flooding in the area. Until in 1968, a shipping channel was cut through um, Bayou Bienvenue, locally called Mr. Go, the Mississippi River outlet, Gulf outlet. And the shipping channel was an economic failure, but it was successful at creating a funnel for um, Hurricane Katrina storm surge and inundating the Lower Ninth Ward and St. Bernard Parish. Residents filed a lawsuit against the Corps of Engineers um, because of that damage and under pressure from a coalition of opponents, the waterway was closed in 2009. In 2013, a surge barrier was erected and Bayou Bienvenue is now part of state and federal coastal restoration plans because of this coalitional advocacy. So I like to imagine Bayou Bienvenue as one of the places from Moise's poem where the protest sound started and still sings. Thank you. I was definitely right to let you follow up, Anna. <laughs> okay, so um, we have one, one last panelist and then we'll move on for Q&A. I'd like to welcome, I'm gonna just close this down for one second. Um, I'd like to welcome Justine uh, Teresias, and she's from the Mouvement Paisan Pape, which is the uh, Pape uh, peasant movement in Haiti. Bonsoir tout le monde. Moi, content et parmi nous après-midi, pour nous partager expérience nous-mêmes en Haïti par rapport à tout travail qu'on a fait par rapport à la crise climatique. Mais en même temps, je remercie l'organisateur d'activité. Je remercie l'organisateur d'activité. Je remercie l'organisateur d'activité. Parce que ça fait me sentir qu'il y a un petit travail qui a fait. Il y a un peu de pour retirer les gens qui sont en position de vulnérabilité ou en position de l'oeil. Alors, moi-même, je suis sorti de MPP. Je suis de MPP. Je suis responsable de la formation. Je suis responsable de la formation. Et je coordonne le programme MPP. Et je suis le coordonnateur pour MPP. Et dans la présentation, je vais montrer tout le travail MPP fait comme... Je vais vous dire résilience par rapport à la vulnérabilité des peuples haïtiens, surtout paysans. À la fin de la présentation, je vais vous montrer tout le travail que MPP a fait pour aider l'effort de résilience pour les plus fortunés. Alors, Haïti, c'est un pays qui est très vulnérable par rapport à 
et des autres même qui gagnent dans le climat. Regarding what's going on with the um, climate. Mais ça, nous avons dit, il vient à partir de une histoire qui sortit depuis la colonisation du pays d'Haïti. La vulnérabilité a commencé avec la commencement de la colonisation. Parce que dans la période de colonisation, il y a eu un gaspillage et un pillage en pile de ressources naturelles. During colonization, they, um, they plunder a lot of our natural resources. They used to make those um, Indian who were living there work the mind to um, export the resources that we had to Europe. Comme conséquence, je dis à un pays d'Haïti, pas qu'il y ait un grain indigène qui reste. Tout est mouru depuis notre travail au tap fait dans période colonisation. As a result, to this day, we do not have any native um, native who are living in the um, country due to the war they did in the past. Ils ont été coupés en pile bois pour exporter dans le pays Europe pour être capable de faire construction et chemin de fer pour être faire un pile de travail de construction en Europe. They cut down a lot of trees to export to Europe so they can build their, uh, their buildings and a lot of other infrastructures in Europe. Et ça fait question dégradation environnement rete yon héritage dans pays d'Haïti. As a result, we inherited deforest deforestation. Et là nous vinn tomber en bas occupation américaine sorti 1915 privé 1934. After the occupation um, from the United States from 1915 to 1934. Deforestation persisted. Parce que il a conséquence de bataille qui était gain pour l'indépendance qui était pour nous. One of the consequences of the revolution. Nous t'es obligé payer une indemnisation pour tête indépendance nous t'es arrivé prend et ça t'es fait non couper pied bois bail ressources naturelles pour nous t'es arrivé à montant indemnisation ça pour nous t'es arrivé payer l'indépendance We had to pay you up for our independence as a result we had to set a lot of our trees um, to be able to afford that cost as a result we are left with deforestation Et alors question de dégradation environnement nous ca dit ça c'est un héritage que colonisation qui était pour nous et qui continue juju dans jodi a deforestation is the consequences of colonization in Haiti parce que ça pas un secret pour tout le monde it's not a secret for anyone nous gagnons l'état qui est très faible we have a weak government qui a répond à obligation l'état l'autre pays imposé yo they are responding to the obligation imposed on them by other countries non offrir tout avantage géopolitique at avantage économique because they offer us a lot of advantage geopolitics and um, economic. Et ça cause pas gain aucun plan qui adéquat qui établi dans pays d'Haïti pour re, re faire environnement pays à et ni protéger tes ressources nous gagnons. As a result, there's no plan to rebuild what we have lost and to create any um, more resources. Alors, par rapport à position pays d'Haïti qui dans Caraïbes là, based on Haiti position in the Caribbean qui placé sous trajectoire tout désastre naturel yo we are currently placed in the path of a lot of natural disasters plus dégradation environnement qui très accéléré um, more um, deforestation ça cause haiti très 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 vulnérable that cause haiti to be very vulnerable nous ca dit sorti dans 30 dernières années yo haiti connaît un pile cyclone for the last 30 years haiti i went to a lot of um, hurricane nous connaît inondation um, we had a lot of floods et en plus tremblement de terre 2010 là qui crasé pays d'haiti and the earthquake in 2010 destroyed most of haiti et ça mettait population en situation vulnérable as a result the population became even more vulnerable 10 ans après gain moun ki a viv toujours en bas tente en toile dans Port-au-Prince 10 years later people are still living in makeshift tents après ces huit tremblements de terre after the earthquake malgré tout l'argent qui était venu en Haïti pour reconstruction despite all the money we received for reconstruction mais pillage à corruption dans l'état plunder and corruption within the government empêcher moun yo sorti dans situation que yo yé prevent people from leaving um, the current situation alors nous toujours dit 
We always say. Consequences are a pile. The consequences are a lot. Ça cause un exode rural qui très 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 et augmente même qu'a dit de façon géométrique. As a result, there's an um, rural exodus that is increasing. Parce que mon yop quitte population rural là. People migrating from the rural cities. À cause de yon sécheresse prolongée qui gagne par rapport à des zones qui gagnent en climat. Due to sécheresse. Pour yon aller dans ville yo. So go to the city. En pile jeune, en pile monde, youth, et, et aller dans l'autre pays. The, the migrating to other countries. Et nous qu'a dit dans l'Amérique latine, nous avons une forte concentration de migrants haïtiens. In Latin America, there's a large population of Haitian immigrants. Qui par exemple bouquet subit question raciste, discrimination, violence. They're going violence, through discrimination, racism and violence. Toute cause. A lot of causes. Pauvreté avec misère augmentée. Poverty and misery is augmenting. Parce que j'aime dire déjà, as I said before, conséquence réchauffement climat, vient faire gagner un grand pile sécheresse dans le pays d'Haïti. Uh, the, uh, the crisis in the climate causes a lot of um, sécheresse. A lot of drought in Haiti. Et ça cause production agricole là baisser seulement 30% de besoins alimentaires population. As a result, there's a decrease in rural production. That affects about 30% of the population. Alors, l'État ici n'a pas fait un rien pour remédier à la situation. Ça. The Asian government did nothing to change the situation. Il a seulement facilité de importateurs dans le secteur bourgeois, importer, the, manger. They facilitated for people from outside to import food. Qui plus passe 80% besoin alimentaire pays. Hein? That is over 80% of our um, demand. Qui de très mauvaise qualité. Which is of bad quality. Et me dit ça lié avec mise population puisque y en a en condition économique qui très précaire. And that intersects with the misery of the population that are living in a vulnerable um, situation. Alors MPP comme un mouvement paysan. MPP which is a um, peasant movement. Qui travaille dans intérêt avec défense that et works, paysan yo. That was for the interest and the qui travaille dans l'intérêt de défense paysan. That, defense works, that works for the interest and the rights of the peasant. Nous travaillons pile avec femmes, avec jeunes et avec paysans, garçons. We work a lot with the um, women, with the youth and a lot of um, peasant men. Côté nous faisons en pile formation technique et idéologique. We do a lot of technical training and dialogic. Pour nous transférer compétences techniques pour nous remédier avec misère que nous la donne en matière d'agriculture. To transfer technical expertise for them to be um, removed from the situation that they're currently living in. Et protection et, et environnement. And also to protect the environment. Nous faisons promotion en pile pour agroécologie. We do a lot of promotion for agriculture. Qui c'est une alternative? Which is an alternative? À crise climatique là. Um, against the climate change. Nous faisons promotion en pile sous question souveraineté alimentaire. We promote a lot of food sovereignty. Qui c'est une réponse nous voulons bailler avec flotte envahissement et importation produits alimentaires qui pas même de bonne qualité. Which is we were trying to deal with the exploitation of food that's coming from our side that is not of um, good quality. Nous travaillons pile tout sous gestion avec conservation des ressources naturelles. We work a lot to protect and maintain our natural resources. Nous faisons un pile jardin précaire et nous transférer et, et compétences à dans tout et, et coin dans le pays. Ya. We create a lot of farms and we also transfer that um, expertise throughout the city. Comme action concrète pour arriver dans la souveraineté alimentaire que nous prônons. As a physical way to promote um, the food security that we're promoting. Nous utilisons déchets et plastiques qui sont un poison pour l'environnement. We use plastic waste, which is um, bad for the environment. Par exemple, nous utilisons caoutchouc qui fin utilisé dans machine yo pour nous produire manger. We use we use tires to um, produce food. Mm -hmm. Nous nous traiter et nous transformer produits plastiques en produits utiles, soit de fantaisie ou bien qui ca gérer déchets tout. We we recycle plastic waste. Et nous 
traité de l'eau qui utilisait déjà pour faire arrosage dans le jardin. We recycle used water for um to uh, to um to sorry to arroser le jardin. We use um recycle water to um to water the garden. Thank you. I'm sorry because my brain is trying to transfer to at the same time. Et puis nous travaillons pile sur question violence qu'a fait sous femme. And we work a lot with um when when it comes to violence against women. Nous baillons pile accompagnement sur éducation avec jeunes yo. We support the youth um with education. Et en dernier lieu, nous supporter plus de 60 familles qui étaient sorties pour au prince après ces islam. And lastly, we support about 60 families who went to Haiti after the earthquake. Que nous baillons compétences au même pour au produit manger pour pas aller créer renforcer bidonvilisation qui déjà existait dans votre prince. We teach them how to go to on food, so just they don't um, add to what, what what already going on the situation. Mais il y a un aspect qui grand en pile nous fait me dit qui paraît concret mais qui gagne une gros importance pour nous c'est éducation populaire. One of the main aspect we are doing is educating the population qui pour faire chaque monde connaît ou son acteur qui pour changer situation à vivre là. So every individual can know their living participants in the situation that they can change it. Pour pas obliger tant de monde porter ba ou. They don't have to force pour someone to um, assist them. Mais pour chercher capacité technique pour sortir dans situation à vivre là. They can find technique um, technical assistance um, to be removed from that situation. Alors dans sens ça. To conclude et responsabilité citoyenne pour chaque monde c'est un dans thème nous font pile sensibilisation sur lui par rapport à crise climatique là c'est un dans moyen qui pour faire nous arriver dans justice climatique so come back from a crisis we tell every individual that they have the right to fight for it as a way to counteract um, the climate crisis ça c'est un point qui concerne tout le monde That concern every single person. Côté riche, côté pauvre. Rather, they are rich or poor. Garçon, femme. Men or women. Jeune, si moun, ou bien grand moun. Young or old. Ke ou blanc ou noir. White or black. Nous connais ça son axe transversal qui pourrait tirer nous pour nous dans situation nous et pour nous arriver sauver planète là qui est. It's an action that can help all of us to be um to change what's going on so we can save the planet. Merci. Thank, Thank you. you. Okay. Um, can we I, well, can we just have another quick round for the whole panel? Okay. So I, I have just a, a few thoughts, and um, and then I really want to let uh, you all speak to the panel, and the panel to speak to one another. So these were some of the thoughts that that I put together as we were initially having the conversation. Um, you all, I had I had emailed these to you guys. I don't know, if you, but it doesn't matter. <laughs> so no, they're not really that important. They're actually um, I think mostly for the audience to just have a little bit of a synthesis to think about some of the the points that folks. Um, or maybe thinking about or talking about a few things that I thought I could throw on the table um, were so, just some thoughts I had in listening to, to all of the panelists was that um, in, in addition to questions of a, a number of um, thinking about deep histories, um, local influences, and thinking about the past, the present, and the future sort of all together in many ways, and I think particularly thinking about questions of how we think about what are holistic and human approaches to these questions, because there's a lot, of a big tendency right now, um, especially among funders, to be thinking about technological very fast fixes and not thinking about how, th how this really works in human terms. So that's something that I think everyone talked about, you could think of talking about. And I'd also like, though, to first actually invite the panel, if you have questions or thoughts you'd like to address to one another directly, um, to give you a few minutes to do that and then turn it over to the audience. I didn't particularly speak to the title of Hunger, Praise to Rage for Resilience, but I, in my experience of reaching out to some of the communities, it became very clear to me that whether it's hunger or it's any basic need that's, that, that um, people are, are facing, 
and whether it's housing, childcare, et cetera, that that is solely their focus and they could only pray, they could only think what a luxury it would be to be able to fight for resilience and it, it, to have the bandwidth to be able to do that. And so that is something that I see in my work as an ongoing challenge. There are community groups that we work with, that work with those communities, but it is, um, it needs to be human centered. And I hear that from, from this whole panel, but some, some of those, uh, I, I, I see what a challenge it is for, for uh, that transformation to happen. Yeah, Adriana. Yes, um, thank you for the prompt, Alexa. I, I wanted to um, ask um, Linnell and Jocelyn, since I feel that both the New Orleans context and the Haitian context have so much to teach Puerto Rico. Um, we were talking a little bit about this um, before the panel uh, in relation to Linnell's book and thinking about tourism. And I was struck by what you said about tourism as recovery, the way that tourism became framed as a form of recovery for New Orleans at the same time as displaced residents were not given any assistance in returning. And then I know from speaking to farmers in Puerto Rico that people are concerned about the ways that people come to help and then end up taking resources, um, either by buying land that is particularly cheap because of the economic crisis or the social crises that are going on. And yet at the same time, help is needed and assistance is needed, but it has to be through a framework that is determined by people who live in the places where the help is being needed and being received. So I wanted to ask both of you if you could say something more about that experience of dealing with the volunteerism or the assistance tourism, the missionizing that is part of that tourism as disaster recovery. Eh, bon, en Haïti, you know that guy who gained John Sotalia. As you just mentioned, question acaparmente très fort. Um, people are buying out of lands. Surtout avec the two derniers governments that have passed there. Especially under the last two governments. After the tremblement de terre. After the earthquake. Surtout dans zone plateau central. On the pla um, plateau central area. Et, et Moun qui te gen te, ou paysan qui gen te, ou qui vit pa gen moyen, ou vend an pil te a bas prix. No mean, and they had to sell them with a lower price. Mais même côté à tout, gagné et de compromis qui fait avec étranger. There were compromises made with um, foreigners. Et en complicité avec l'État haïtien, ils ont acheté un pil te, et c'est grand quantité te. In association with the Haitian government, they bought a large number of lands. Il y a un bagage qui gagne conséquences négatives sur l'agriculture pays à tout. That has negative um, consequences on the um, agriculture. Et même multinationales, ils ont gagné des zones, ils ont rivé acheté. Multinational companies have bought lands. Et là, nous déjà connaissons conséquences dans les années qui viennent. C'est mettre les paysans au dehors pour eux même exploiter tes salaires. And we know in the future they are going to displace the peasants for them to exploit those lands. Ensuite, chercher mais d'œuvres bon marché paysans salaires qui pouvaient travailler sous tes eaux, qui pratiquement sont formes d'esclavage. And find cheap laborers to work those lands, which is another form of slavery. Mais pour question touriste là. When it comes to tourism. Impact qui gagne sous pays a salié tout avec environnement. The impact that exists has also has to do with the environment. Parce que une série de produits qui pas bon pour sol là. There are a lot of products that are not good for the soil. C'est au même yo importé en pile juste pour satisfaire et Mkadi business tourist là. And they are putting a lot of them to satisfy the um. Et yo la gagne au n'importe façon. And they put them any um any place anywhere. Et ça pollue ni terre. That cause um, pollution in the land. It produce, it 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 um, water contamination. Et entre dans la mer pour tuer poisson qui gagne dans la mer tout. And goes to the ocean um, to kill the fishes. Et en, en plus de ça. In addition of that. 
Dans dernier temps, vous m'avez dit avec deux derniers gouvernements qui étaient dans le pays d'Haïti. Doing the last two governments. Gain un pile contrat en bataille que population n'a pas connu. There were a lot of contracts that the population was not aware of. Ils ont fait avec de entreprises étrangères. Those contracts were made with foreign um, enterprises. Pour venir exploiter ressources minières en Haïti. To exploit our um, resources, natural resources. Ça veut dire, c'est pas une situation qui isole ni dans New Orleans ni Puerto Rico seul. Mais nous même tout en Haïti n'a pas le même problème. Ce n'est pas une situation qui only to New Orleans, mais aussi nous en Haïti nous avons eu la même situation. Est-ce que vous voulez apprendre quelque chose de New Orleans? Je pensais. Mais je peux parler. Je veux dire, comme vous le savez, certains de ces mêmes processus qui se passent en termes de volontarisme and church organizations come in. People have written about this politics of charity. Um, and you know, you mentioned some of the, the issues with that. One of them is just this sort of neoliberal approach to recovery that looks at this individual responsibility for charity that doesn't address some of the, the structural issues that, that need addressing and, and then doesn't call for the state to do any work that, that should be done. One of the, the things that also happened, I think in large part because of the, the volunteerism, was that New Orleans population change. It became younger and wider. There was a lot of celebration of this young class of social entrepreneurs who were coming in, in many cases with good intentions. Many came in as Teach for America, you know, young people. But they were replacing all of the, the teachers, mostly um, you know, tenured middle class black women who were um, teachers and administrators, but Hurricane Katrina allowed them to disband the union and fire all of those people. Um, so I think there has been some really um, difficult but important um, conversations and negotiations and demands by people in the community that, that white people who do come in, who want to, to work as allies and in coalition have to um, really recognize the role that they are playing as well in gentrification and displacement and to, to be self-reflexive and, and to really follow the lead of people in the community and trying to mm -hmm. you know, do that, that kind of work. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Uh, other other thoughts you want to exchange to one another before I open it up? I had a question for Jane. Have you been talking to people in New Orleans? Is there, <laughs> is there some ways that there are, um, you know, sort of Gulf Coast regional networks where other people in cities are doing this kind of work to go out into communities and assess with those human needs are? So I, I had the um, pleasure, I was asked to speak at a disaster recovery conference in New Orleans a couple years ago. So I was able to connect with a lot of people, community groups working post Katrina on, on, on it's not on? Oh, I think you just need to speak into it. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, I was able to go to New Orleans a couple years ago and, and meet up with a lot of community groups that were working on post-recovery um, Katrina and just building more of that citizen capacity for disaster response in the future. And it really inspired me to bring, you know, Miami prides itself as having one of the best emergency response teams in the country, and it does, but it, it, it was behind on some of that citizen emergency response. And um, so that really inspired me to work on the CERT teams and the Resilience Hubs work. Uh, has there been enough? No, I, I, I did, you know, through 100 Resilient Cities, meet with the former CRO and with a couple of other individuals there, but there probably could be more of an interaction for sure. I mean, it almost sounds too like you were meeting with community groups, but there's not a comparable person in the city of New Orleans who's doing 
There, there, uh, there is a chief resilience officer, at least there was. Jeff Hubert was the first one um, before I even was a uh, chief resilience officer, and I de definitely dealt with him and then his deputy for in the beginning of our work, for sure. Yeah. I guess, so good guy, bad yeah. guy? Yeah, <laughs> good guy, great guy. He burned yeah. out, right. and right. I don't know if he got replaced. Uh, it's a tough role. And New Orleans was a tough role. Yeah. Mm -hmm. it, it occurs to me as a follow-up to that question that um, you can have a chief resiliency officer, but depending on what that person and their group's perspective on what resiliency means, means that their programming could look wildly different, you know, and their approach to what that means and the type of work they're willing to do or willing to find funding to do and all that could be really variable. So I wanted to first dispel the notion that people of color and impoverished people, impoverished nations cannot do for themselves in times of uh, natural disasters because we have done that for thousands of years. And that is what's being witnessed now in Puerto Rico and other countries where people, we have no schools, okay? The schools have crumbled, no plan or um, intent so far to replace them, to fix the housing, to fix the highways. But people are doing it for themselves. The teachers have come out and they're teaching in outside of the schoolyards. People are doing for themselves and I really want to applaud everyone who's doing that. I want to ask as a diasporican, uh, what can we do, you know, because I know that when you go there to help, you're really taking resources of your host away from what they need for their daily lives, cars, whatever. What can we do to help from here and not just send money to organizations that are just going to make it disappear? Uh, I feel compelled to respond to that. Um, <laughs> but if anybody else wants to say something. Um, so thank you for the question. Um, and I think it's something that many people are asking themselves. Um, and you know, participating in volunteerism requires a lot of resources. You have to have time off from work and money and all kinds of things to be able to go down there or whatever uh, to help. Um, so there has to be ways of creating solidarity and support that don't require those kinds of resources. And in fact, that was integral to the, the response um, after Hurricane Maria when three weeks had gone by and no, no relief supplies had arrived in Puerto Rico, the relief supplies that were arriving were arriving mostly from the diaspora uh, and from uh, our friends all over the world. Uh, but I want, and so there's many ways that one can help and some of which are material and others of which are epistemological or, or at the level of, of concepts or at the level of culture. Right, and one of the things that I think Puerto Ricans, we as Puerto Ricans need to work hard on is transforming the colonial logics of our culture. And one of those colonial logics is, is racism and white supremacy and colorism. And that is fundamental to transforming the conditions, those structural conditions of life in Puerto Rico because it's not the rich white kids in San Juan that are without schools. You see what I'm saying? So if, if we're gonna be able to create some kind of coherent response, and I think we kind of need to start with ourselves as well and uh, build, uh, build on the movements that already exist and cr continue creating uh, links of solidarity with others, other oppressed peoples around the world and especially in the global south. And we, but there are limits to that, and I've written a little bit about that, right? Autogestion is something that is beautiful, that those autonomous organizing efforts are beautiful and powerful, and they've been the source of survival and hope for thousands of people in Puerto Rico as in other places. But we've also confronted the limits of that, right? As Lidl was just talking about that neoliberal model of recovery that doesn't require the state to do anything, right? Because the people are already scrambling to try to help each other. And so that's the response in Puerto Rico right now. It's like, we know that help is not coming, so we have to do it for ourselves. But that also abandons an important sphere of political battle that, it, you know, it'd be great if we could just ignore it and it would go away, but unfortunately it doesn't just go away because we ignore it. And so even though I consider myself an anarchist, I, I still think that we have to do battle at the level of the state. I think that we have to engage with some strategic, um, I mean, it gets dirty, right? But we have to engage with some strategic uh, 
a, I hate to say the word partnerships, but some strategic alliances that can maybe allow us to move forward some political transformations in the United States, because that would have a big difference. That would make a big difference uh, in what happens in Puerto Rico if the, poli if the political sphere is transformed into the, in the United States. But, that's, uh, but at, the, at another level, that's the question of decolonization, right? And how do we transform not only the material conditions of colonialism, but also the, the epistemic ones or the, the conceptual ones. And I think Puerto Ricans, ha we have a long way to go in that regard. Yeah. I think we have another, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Um, my question is also for you, Adriana. Um, I really appreciate the way you, Adriana, and you, Linnell, in particular, invoke the histories that led to these current moments, because so often these crises are sort of moments of spectacular crisis, a hurricane, an earthquake. And you've really pointed to the ways in which these development projects over time have resulted in. Um, but anyway, Adriana, my question is mostly for you. I'm, so much of the rhetoric and language coming out of the US government in the response to Puerto Rico has been that of a lack of gratitude, right? The sort of neoliberal focus on, you should be so grateful, right? As an, as an individual space, we've given you all of this, right? Not thinking about how these histories of debt and really the sort of emptying out of populations, of skilled populations, of teachers, doctors, nurses, right? That would kind of ameliorate some of these conditions or even things like the decades of bombings in Vieques for military exercises, right? The role of these histories in these sort of contemporary spectacular events. So I'm wondering if you just would talk a little bit about how you sit with that, the way, the sort of narrative of where Puerto Rico and, you know, in, in some of the same ways the Virgin Islands sits when these things happen versus the kind of longer histories that lead to them. Yeah, thanks, Tammy. I mean, I think, it, of course, it's not just Puerto Rico and as I think you know, your work is so important, your work on the U.S. Virgin Islands. I always shout you out because I think that you, the, the, it's so invisibilized, the relationship between not just Puerto Rico, but these other island territories that exist both in the Caribbean and in the Pacific, right? So one of the, talking about how do we build solidarity, one of the ways that I've tried to do it is to engage with scholars and activists from other U.S. territories so that we can actually start to see the ways in which the models of colonial governmentality are connected. And those histories of military exploitation and the histories of policing, racist policing, and the histories of um, uh, militarism and public health are actually interconnected in the sense that some of the same ideologues and, and military people were moving between these different islands, right? So when, you know, that, that discourse of ungratefulness is one of the oldest colonial discourses that exist, right? About how could you, you know, we, we gave you civilization and, and, and this is what you do. And in that regard, my favorite response to that is, comes from Shakespeare, actually. Uh, and it's from Caliban when Prospero tells him, I, I taught you how to speak and this is how you repay me. And Caliban says that you taught me your words so that I might curse you. Yeah. <laughs> so in that regard, you know, I have no thanks to give. Uh, I have only rage, you know? So, um, <laughs> I'll take that. <laughs> so, but I, but I think that that's, that rage is beautiful. And it, I, I love when I can connect with uh, sisters and brothers from the Pacific, for example, and from the US Virgin Islands, and see that, or from Haiti, and see that we are, we are all in that space together. And then that makes it a little easier. I don't feel so alone, because I feel like we're all, we're all in that fight together. And so, you know, I, that, that discourse of ingratitude is, is just the mask of imperialism. I just want to add the Isle of Orleans should be in that conversation. Yes, too. agreed. I mean, we're refugees, yeah. like we heard. And um, yeah, it has a lot to do with, you know, the narrative in New Orleans was, do we deserve to be rebuilt? Why should New Orleans want right. this look with the, and the, all the narratives about oh, now that this happened, this wonderful act of God, we can finally take back this city and do something. Right, the governor of Puerto Rico called Puerto Rico a, a, a clean slate after the right. Hurricane Maria. The same language yeah. they used in New Orleans and treated it, which gave them an opportunity to accelerate some of the things that were already happening before, but to raise all of the public housing, for mm -hmm. instance, to get rid of the public schools. So now all the public schools are charter schools. Mm -hmm. So to really push through all of this sort of privatization of the city that Hurricane Katrina provided an opportunity, which it's often talked about as an opportunity. Yeah. Katrina yeah. Is. 
I want to, we're moving into uh, break time, but we do have one more person with a microphone, and I want to let her ask her question. This is a quick question, but thank you, the entire panel for the highly informative information that you presented. My question is for Ms. Jane Gilbert. Miami is uh, one of the uh, 100 resilient cities. Now, your presentation was all-encompassing. The slides, the visual, the tone, the overall, the way you organize your thoughts showed me that you, that you really represented in a high fashion inclusivity. Now, how much of that inclusivity was there and you brought into constructing the grant for, one, a resil for 100 resilient cities? Because you had all of the jewels, but not the necklace. So how did you incorporate from getting those two communities together, and you being a white female, I'm sure you had some challenges with the people in, in my community, in the black community. Now, how were you able to orchestrate their input into the design of that proposal so that you would win? So I wish I could say that we got a lot of input before we applied to become a member, which honestly we did not. Um, uh, in the process of once we had the resources to develop the strategy and were able to go out to the communities. Um, I've lived in Miami 25 years. I've worked in community development and edu education. And so uh, I guess I came to the process with strong connections in the community uh, and some basic trust uh, about where I came from. So this has been my first government job. Uh, I've been mostly in nonprofit work. So, so that helped. Um, but we, we reached out and, and made sure our partners in the neighborhoods were a part of the process in terms of recruiting people and giving us feedback. We learned, we, we didn't do it right the first time. I, I mentioned that. I mean, we, we, we were talking at them too much and not listening enough. We were using language that was not approachable. And, um, but I would say that the, the 100 Resilience Framework intends to be inclusive. It intends to, um, but they were, Talking up here and not, not, not really meeting people where they were at. So that was the work that we tried to do in that second round with that strat that second round strategy. Um. I'm very sorry to have to end it there. We're on our break, I would encourage you to talk to the panelists and ask some other questions and follow up. I had a question over I, here. I, I have a question it, here too. I, I'm. Okay. I mean, I don't know. What, I don't know what else you want me to do. This was my. I'm just fault. You know, I'm trying to. Okay. So that's cool. Hi, I'm happy to my have name it. Is Akira. Um, I thank you for this conference and also being on Lenape land. Um, my question is specific to. I'm a researcher. I do work community work in Barbuda, and Barbuda was impacted by Hurricane Irma in 2017. And also, Barbuda, thinking about it, has disaster capitalism just in terms of it being a race media attention was not on it in terms of resiliency. So my question specifically, I am also Caribbean, I'm from Grenada, and I'm curious about what does, I guess, a diasporic sharing of knowledge look like? Because right now there's folks in who I know in Grenada and different islands who have knowledge to share. It's just a matter of people are not really knowing each other to do that cross diasporic work. So I'm just really curious of like, what does that look like because Folks in Barbuda have knowledge that they want to share in terms of their resiliency and, what, and what's going on on the ground. Um, and other islands also have that knowledge. So I'm just curious of what do you imagine the future of that knowledge, resilient sharing looking like for us right now? I was trying to convince Jocelyn to say something. <laughs> um, 
So thank you for the question, sis. And uh, Barbuda is a, a place that I learned a lot about after the hurricanes. And I was deeply moved by what I learned, which is that it was one of the only places in the Caribbean where the descendants of formerly enslaved people had uh, been given land as reparations for slavery. And I find it um, deeply horrifying that this, uh, uh, the hurricane and the disaster caused by the hurricane led to the removal of people from that land. And I was also really encouraged to learn from another researcher that there are people who refused to leave <laughs> and actually stayed in the caves when they came to, um, to, uh, to remove everybody from the island, that there were people who actually took shelter in caves in order to not leave their land. Um, so I know that what you're saying is true, that there are like deep wells of um, re resilience and knowledge there. And um, I, I think your question is a beautiful question that I don't quite have an answer to. I'll just leave it open. But what I will say is that the disconnection that exists between islands in the Caribbean is on purpose. Like that is deliberate. That is, that is a, a lack of connection that has been fostered because the region used to be much more deeply interconnected than it is now through sailing, basically, uh, and indigenous practices that were nomadic practices. And so those connections between the, the, the creation of the disconnection between our peoples is, the, is one of the strategies of colonial governance, right? It's to prevent us from actually talking to each other. And so we have to find ways of cutting through that and actually doing exactly what you say, what you just said. It Et moi, moi, je conseille pas me tout que me capoter pour et qui a fait un travail dans Bermude. Uh, my advice to you is working in Bermuda. Et nous pas de rester isolé, faut que nous cherchions connecter nous avec l'autre réseau qui déjà existait. Do not remain isolated. Um, try to connect yourself with those um, communities that already existed. Dans Caraïbes, il y a plusieurs espaces. There are many spaces in the Caribbean. Parmi eux, gagnent et à assembler peuple caraïbe. There's one called assembler peuple caraïbe. Côté au partager tout ça qui fait et là des connexions à quand pile organisation. They are they share all the knowledge, knowledge and they have connection with a lot of other organizations. Qui accompagne monde qui en situation vulnérable et là gagnent pile échange de bonnes pratiques tout qui fait. And they also share a lot of good practices there as well. Moi penser ou même ou doit chercher couloir ça parce que c'est un couloir qui est ouvert. I think you should find a way to reach out to them so pour, it's open. Pour toute organisation qui dans Caraïbes là entrer dans espace ça côté nous ca apprendre en pile de nous et yon de l'autre. For all the organizations in the Caribbean to get together so can learn from one from one another. Parce que c'est un espace sous qui fait promotion pour solidarité entre acteurs et acteurs entre pays et pays. It is a that provides solidarity between actors and countries. I think it's one of the means for us to go um, further. Thank you. Thank you. Everyone else? Yes. 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 Yes.